commodities are extremely important in supply chains. There are all types of different commodities, agricultural, uh, industrial metals, um, lead, um, aluminum, uh, platinum, and so on, uh, precious metals, some of them. And of course, all kinds of energy-related commodities. So most firms that are in manufacturing or industrial supply chains, they have to buy a lot of those commodities. And uh, typically, we're concerned a lot about uh, volatility of things like interest rates or exchange rates. But if you go and you compare the volatility of some of the commodities versus the other risks, uh, like uh, interest rates and exchange rates, you're going to realize that the commodities are much more volatile. It's not uncommon at all to see volatility of 30 and 40 and sometimes 60 percent within a year. Um, I remember the numbers for uh, silver in 2010, spring 2010, it was around uh, $15 uh, an ounce, and then it suddenly became, uh, within a year, uh, close to $50. So the volatility is quite high. Even though we are in a period of time where the prices of commodities are rather low, if you go and you look at the volatility over the last two, three years, it has been uh, quite huge. Uh, we do have some reasons of why that happens. It's supply and demand, and uh, we are all uh, concerned about China and uh, the drop in demand there, and that drives uh, both the, the lower prices in some of the commodities, but also at the same time, the uncertainty is going to drive a lot of volatility. And volatility for our business people means risk. Well, hedging practices of firms are not uh, uniform at all. Some firms hedge and other firms don't hedge. Uh, sometimes the same firm might be hedging certain commodities and not hedging others. I would say that probably more than half of the firms right now, they're not hedging at all. Uh, in their perception and the perception of many executives, hedging is nothing more than speculation, uh, which we're going to argue that is not necessarily true. But uh, the firms that they hedge, they are concerned about the impact of, uh, let's say, commodity prices on their cash flows. And they would like to minimize the cash flow volatility and try to uh, eliminate as much of the risk associated with their cash flows uh, as possible. So it's a little more of a risk minimization type of an approach, so why they're hedging. And uh, in a few cases, uh, some firms also, they speculate and they are feeling comfortable with it. Well, hedging is actually the dirty word in uh, corporate finance. Uh, so if you go all the way back to the purity of corporate finances reflected in their fundamental theory of Modigliani and Miller, in a world that has per perfect information and there are no transaction costs, and in those situations you can fully separate financing from uh, operational considerations, uh, hedging plays no role. Therefore, uh, the answer of that theory will be no hedging is necessary. If uh, investors at the individual level are risk averse and concerned about risk, they should go and do the hedging themselves. Uh, of course, over time, uh, the theories also in corporate finance start uh, reflecting uh, certain imperfections in the market that break down the Modigliani-Miller theory. So market imperfections like uh, taxes, um, you go and you borrow, you might be exposed to risks of bankruptcy and bankruptcy costs. Uh, you have managers that make decisions that uh, their interests might not be perfectly aligned with the firm. For these uh, transaction type and breakdown of, of the market, uh, perfect market assumption, assumptions, in those situations the theory will argue that the firm should hedge. And uh, the the more um, uh, convincing, at least uh, in my mind, uh, the theory of uh, hedging for firms is you do it uh, because uh, you would like to be able to implement your long-term strategy in terms of the investments that you would like to make at different points in time. Factors like commodity prices that are affecting uh, your cash flows and expose them to volatility uh, sometimes uh, creating situations where you have inadequate funds to make your investments that support your long-term strategy create risks for the firm that have to be dealt. And hedging is a nice way uh, to take uh, some of the good scenarios where you have a lot of funds and transfer some of those funds to other stages of the world where you have inadequate funds.
and by doing so you are able to implement your investments according to your long-term strategy and in those situations uh, hedging uh, generates uh, increased expected profits and supports your long-term strategy and makes sense. That is the best answer that is out there uh, right now. But again, when you go and you look at that answer, is uh, every firm in isolation decides if they're going to hedge or not, based in the presence of uh, imperfect markets, uh, information asymmetries or transaction cost, and some of these costs also are going to constrain their implementation of long-term strategy, and therefore if they hedge one commodity, they should be hedging all of them. And if they are hedging in one situation for one product or one market, they should be hedging for all products and all markets, which we are going to argue that is the weakness of the current theory. We are going to argue that uh, hedging decisions of firms should not be made in isolation. You got to understand the supply chain you are part you are part of and whom you depend on. Uh, you depend on your suppliers, uh, you depend on firms that are downstream uh, and the markets uh, that you are selling to. And within that more complex system you got to understand the role that hedging plays. Uh, that is what we call the supply chain theory of hedging. It depends on the nature of your products, uh, the nature of the markets you are selling, uh, the market power that I, or the power that you have within the supply chain and who are your counterparties within the supply chain in deciding how are you going to hedge. That allows us to eliminate some of the weaknesses of the previous theory that the firm in isolation and in all cases makes all decisions and our theory will seem to imply that for certain products in certain supply chains and uh, depending on the structure of those supply chains and the power that you have, sometimes you hedge and other times you don't. So uh, will allow us to give answers uh, to practices that we see out there that firms use and we think they're using them effectively but the current theory would have said that they should have been hedging or situations where our firms are not hedging and the current theory would have implied that they should be hedging. So we have start providing a more complete picture I'm not going to argue that we answer all the questions, but we have moved one step forward, realizing that hedging is a much more complex issue and depends on the partners within the supply chain and their practices. Within a supply chain, uh, when, uh, when you look at, uh, let's take it in a very simple uh, two-party supply chain, you have a supplier and you have a buyer, uh, we are always concerned about the continuity of supply. What happens if uh, the prices are so high that my supplier cannot produce? What happens if the commodities that my buyer buys uh, have such high prices that he decides that he's not going to sell anything to the market and he's going to cancel the order? Discontinuity of supply, either from the supplier or from the buyer side, uh, or discontinuity of supply or discontinuity of, uh, uh, of ordering, is a major threat and a major risk within supply chains that firms would like to deal with. And we're arguing that in order to deal with it, you need contracts uh, that uh, need to have penalties uh, when you're going to default in delivering what you promise according to the contract, but those penalties have to be credible, both in terms of their magnitude. Uh, you cannot expect to become rich when your partner fails, but he should compensate for whatever are the implied cost to you as a result of their inability to deliver. But uh, those penalties should be credible in the sense that actually can be paid in any state of the world in any realized uh, commodity prices. And that can only happen if uh, your partner in the supply chain is hedging via financial markets. The financial hedging creates the credibility of the supply contracts that are going to guarantee the continuity of the supply chain in any state of the world. And that is extremely important and that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. Again, uh, the supply chain theory is, is quite rich in the sense that it starts realizing what is the role that you play within the supply chain. Are you the buyer or are you the supplier? And the perspective of the buyer and the supplier will be different in terms of uh, why you hedge and when you hedge. 
if you are the buyer, if you are the downstream firm, we are going to argue that uh, in most cases you like hedging. Uh, it guarantees the continuity of supply for you and uh, at the same time if you yourself are willing to hedge then you are a very reliable buyer for the supplier that is going to reward with uh, lower prices. So that's advantageous uh, hedging uh, and as I argue the hedging if you hedge also your supplier has to hedge if that is happening that supply chain is a desirable supply chain especially for the downstream firm. It's lower prices and higher profits. Uh, but as I argue, is you are going to hedge only if your uh, partner is going to hedge. If they are not going to hedge, you are not going to hedge either. Because uh, uh, hedging when they have not hedged exposes you to the volatility of the prices and you might have heavy obligations in the financial markets. So the uh, answer here is that uh, either you are dealing uh, with a counterparty that is sophisticated enough uh, and uh, willing to hedge with you or you have the power to enforce the hedging upon your suppliers. So that's the answer with respect to the buyer. Uh, the answer with respect to the supplier is a little more complex. In general the supplier might not always see it as advantageous to hedge. If they have the power and they can pass uh, some of their risks uh, to the downstream firm, they're not going to hedge. If I am Belden and I'm buying aluminum and copper and I'm selling to Graybar and um, these are highly customized products uh, to a firm that has uh, substantial margins and probably they can't find a lot of suppliers that can provide my kind of services, I'm going to pass the risk of the aluminum and copper to them and they're going to accept it. In that case, I'm not going to hedge. So if you have the power in the supply chain as a, uh, as a supplier, uh, in many cases you're not going to hedge. Uh, the cases that you're going to hedge is when you see a downstream buyer that has very good demand and high volumes, but at the same time you see tight margins and you're always afraid about what commodity prices will do to those tight margins. You would love to continue to have that business and in that situation you would like to hedge and make sure of course that also your buyer is going to hedge as well. In that case you guarantee a uh, cash flow stream uh, of high volume and especially if your margins are better than that of the downstream firm also very good margins. So that is the answer that our theory gives. Commodity risks are, uh, are significant, they are important, and they come uh, in multiple facets. Procurement managers especially, they have to be very careful on how co commodities are affecting uh, their uh, transactions. And of course, uh, manufacturing firms, they are getting exposed not only to commodities they buy directly, but also commodities that their suppliers are using in their products. And that uh, indirect exposure to commodity risk is something that our supply chain theory clearly identified and uh, very carefully captured. So uh, the, uh, the answer uh, of our theory is simple. I'm going to look at one product at a time, one supply chain at a time. Uh, what is my role in the supply chain? Am I the supplier or am I the buyer? Am I upstream or am I downstream? Uh, what is the volatility and what are the threats that that volatility creates? Discontinuity of supply on the part of my suppliers or potential of some of my buyers fail, fa failing to execute on some of the, of, of the placed orders upon me. Uh, those are things that I have to consider. Then the important thing is how much power do I have? Can I pass some of the risks uh, to the other uh, player? If I cannot, then I have to start thinking about it. What am I going to do about it? But also the most important thing is my actions are not independent of the actions of my counterparties. I got to find a way to have information about what they're planning to do and what is their overall perspective on hedging or not hedging. And uh, if they hedge, then uh, especially if I'm a downstream player, I would like to be hedging as well. Uh, if I am an upstream player, I have to see if it makes sense for me to hedge or not. And uh, uh, of course, quite a lot of that uh, has uh, to deal with, uh, with the risks that my downstream player is facing in the presence of volatility. Hedging is, uh, is a more complex issue that, uh, relative to what are the answers out there. It's not just mar uh, market imperfections, but as long as they exist, we immediately hedge, as some of the corporate finance uh, literature seems to imply. 
they have to be viewed one product at a time, one supply chain at a time, and deciding the role we play. Uh, to give you a simple example is, uh, if you are Emerson, uh, you are not always hedging or not hedging. Um, Emerson doesn't have a lot of consumer product, but they do have some. We buy their garbage disposals and we buy their power tools. They are selling those products uh, through uh, major retailers and um, Home Depot and other improvement stores. Some of those buyers uh, have a lot of power and they would expect them to hedge, and in those situations they do. At the same time, uh, they sell in business-to-business -business transactions, uh, custom products, large customized with uh, big margins, uh, let's say large industrial motors that they sell to other industrial companies and utilities. In those situations, they have the power to pass through quite a lot of the risk uh, through index contracts, and they do that. Uh, so they don't feel the need to hedge. Uh, in other situations, uh, they're working with uh, standardized motors and tight margins, uh, but unfortunately they have a lot of small suppliers that are providing these kind of, con of contracts. They would like uh, to have their suppliers hedge, and of course they would like to hedge at the same time, but recognizing the inability of their suppliers to hedge, they don't hedge either. So uh, when you talk to companies that understand base, uh, be better these type of hedging uh, complexities, you will see that the answer when I hedge and why I hedge, it really depends. And it's not like we fully understand everything, but for sure there are differential hedging practices out there that our theory allows us to better explain and give some good advice for the supply chain managers.